Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. First hour is general discussion about media and, and virtual production. A second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, today, John here is going to be talking about slides and how to how to make your uh, your presentation slides a lot better, pep them, pep them up a bit. Uh, so it should be, should be good. We're going to talk a lot about presentations over the next uh, couple months because I think they're pretty important. Um, they can get a lot of things done, more things than you can imagine. So, uh, so uh, we'll be talking about that in the second hour. Of course, the third hour is um, is our uh, our hour around education. And so that's usually not on YouTube, or it is not on YouTube. So, so, so you have to be in Zoom for that. And then, as a note, if you're in Discord, uh, you can. We're doing a special event at eleven with Michael Krasny. Um, and uh, if you're interested in that, you'll see the link there. All right, let's jump into the first question, Mitchell. First question from Eric Antonio, and he wants to know, can the panel, sorry about that, uh, can the panel recommend a KVM switch that will maintain the high resolution output of a MacBook Pro and Studio going into a single monitor? Or is it best practice to use dedicated monitors and only switch to keyboard and mouse? Thanks. I have to say that I, I don't know of any KVM that maintains the Mac high resolution as you pass through it. So you're going to get basically kind of a crunchy 1080p going through a KVM. And I don't, I don't have a better solution for that. So you, you want to buy a, a Mac, or if, if you're dealing with a Mac specifically, um, that's something you have to kind of deal with. Go ahead, Courtney. I did look, uh, do a search on, on Mac compatibles. <clears throat> There's one uh, called Raritan, Raritan Dominion KX IV or 4 101 ultra performance one port 4K KVM switch. And uh, it says that it's. It's the, around 649 bucks. Wow. And it says it's Mac compatible and it says high resolution, ultra high performance. You know, yeah, I, have I haven't used it. it, so I'm just. Yeah. It is recommended, but I don't know if it's going to work for you. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been successful at it, but maybe you will be. <laughs> so, so the uh, so we've we've tried it, and I I basically don't don't do anything with the Mac outputs. If I want to get the full resolution, I'm plugging them straight into a monitor that's com that is compatible, and generally it's a monitor that's going to accept something like Thunderbolt because that means that it's kind of built for it, as opposed to just taking an HDMI input. And this one's still HDMI coordinating, or is that, or is it? No, and it, it's uh, over IP, I should mention that. So it's KVM over IP, so you can remotely control it over the Ethernet. And what are the outputs from the computer? Is it doing the, the monitor out of the... Um, I'm confused. Is it doing the, is it doing the monitor um, output over the Ethernet, or is it doing monitor output over Thunderbolt? What it looks it like it's over the Ethernet. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. There's the, uh, there's the, the picture of it. And it has it all going into the IP network. And these are the KVMs over here. I so don't think it's that it's probably transcoding it to some type yeah. of IP and then uh, switching it remotely. I, I don't feel secure that that's going to work. <laughs> but, but it is over. It, it is definitely overkill for a, a local setup. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it may, it may work for doing what we're doing. I don't know if it'll work for a Mac. Um, the next question, Jonas Isjur from Karlsruhe, Germany. Uh, his question is: Is there a presenter or software that can advance keynote PowerPoint slides, even if the window is not highlighted? Yeah, I think that you actually need. Um, I think that you'll need to use Apple Script for that because it has to basically, um, and I'll show you may be able to build a shortcut that actually talks to it. The Apple Script hooks are pretty deep in Keynote, um, but it has to be something that's going to get a, a global um, advance. Generally, Keynote does not work once it goes into the background. You, you can't forward uh, slides with it. It's kind of built that way for a reason. Um, so, um, but but I think that you can do it through Apple scripting and uh, through shortcuts, but I've never, never tried. Usually what happens is for me when I'm doing presentations is I, I have a computer that's doing the presentations. <laughs> like that's what it does, and I'm not trying to do anything else with it. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons I use a HyperDeck. Um, is or not HyperDeck, but a but an A10 Mini is because I can easily switch between my slide deck back to another computer that I want to show you something on, and then back to the slide deck or back to me. And that's why one of the reasons that the A10 Mini is so powerful as a and I've been using switchers in my systems. The A10 Mini is the smallest, more, most compact one, um, but I've been using switchers in my systems for uh, over ten years. 
um, specifically so I can, I can jump, I, I'm going to talk to you about something and now I'm going to jump to a, a, a piece of software. Now I'm going to jump to a camera. Now I'm going to jump to me. Now I'm going to come back to the presentation. And I'm still back where I started and I'm not jumping in and out. I would highly recommend not having, you're trying to do multiple things with your presentation machine. If you can at, at all avoid it for doing demos. Um, next question. Vic Hernandez in Springfield, Missouri. Can I get a recommendation for an optical drive to use with my Mac Mini? Read write would be cool, but mainly I want to watch some DVDs. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, the Lacies. I've had good good luck with the Lacies, and you get one with a USB C connector on it, uh, an optical drive, a little portable optical drive, and it powers itself and and is a DVD RW drive, so you can write to it as well. I don't think you can buy one that's not DVRW, you know, <laughs> like like DVD, like everything writes it. They're like, oh, you, we assume you want to write something out there, um, and it, it does. Does it do Blu-ray as well? I think so. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The uh, uh, I have one. I think it's a Samsung, but it, you know, it, it was not very expensive. And same thing. And I just use it to. There's a handful of. It's it's interesting. There's a handful of DVDs and Blu-rays that my Blu-ray player won't play so but my but the but the i can get the computer to like figure it out and and rip it <laughs> so so that's been the, the, the funny thing is that i just get it to, to deal with the compatibility issues um go ahead mitchell yeah most of the compatibility issues come up with the uh, the media you're using but if a straight up dvd that's the easiest thing in the world for any you'd think movie. you'd think yeah, but for like years I, um Sorry for butting in here. Uh, for years, uh, Jobs didn't want to sign the deal to do the to to allow DVD writing on the Mac because of the uh, anti piracy implementations that had to be done. So for years, there were a series of Macs that couldn't. <laughs> that's why there were no DVD writers in Macs for the longest time. Yeah, but in this case, I have ones that the DVD. These are commercial DVDs that will not play on a Blu-ray, my commercial Blu-ray player, but will play on my one that hooks into my computer. So I can see it. I, here's the funny thing is I can't play it from there, I, you know, in, in the window, but I can rip it. <laughs> so the, the bits are all there, but I can't get a hold of it unless I turn it into a movie. So like, for instance, I think the one DVD example is The Gods Must Be Crazy. The Gods Must Be Crazy, for some reason, is not available on anything, probably because it's horribly inappropriate once you look back on it. But it was funny when we were that age. And um, and the uh, you can I couldn't get it to play. And so I, I ended up just pulling it pulling it in there and and because uh, it would only play little bits and pieces of it. And if there's something, you know, it's a very odd thing. All right. Next question. Next question coming in from Steve Uroff in Madison, Wisconsin. Is it possible to track how much each participant in a Zoom meeting talks and calculate percentages? Mr. Preto? There is a uh, an app, an add-in app called uh, Meeting Metrics, and that will track time. You have, to, you have to record the meeting, and then it runs the metrics. I, I haven't seen percentages on that app. And the other one was, uh, Alex, you might remember, what was the name of that app that put everybody in a circle that was on the oh. second hour. I don't I remember. remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they also track talk time and, and right. I can't find them, but yeah, they're, they're out there. Yeah. Uh, next question. And next question from Todd Rains and Allen, Te Allen, Texas, any advice on a mixer to get in-person audio and zoom audio to the room, then in-person and zoom to the ATEM to record. Then in-person audio to Zoom. Yeah, so you can do this with most major mixers. It is a, you know, it's a complex set of mix minuses that that are required. So I think that what you're trying to do here is, and we would typically use an X32 or a QL1 or, or something like that would be probably the mixer that we would use for most of these things. You might be able to get away with it with a Flow 8. Basically what you're doing is you're, do, you're building a set of mix minuses. Um, so you have the, um, the room is a mix minus itself. Um, you know, the way mix minuses work, <laughs> I went to go get my, my teleprompter, but I don't have it today. Um, the, the way that the a mix minus works is it's, it's a bus, it's a separate bus. So you, you need a, you need a mixer that can handle multiple buses and you basically have a separate bus that is, it's all of all the volumes minus the one that is going that, that you're listening to. So you have a mix minus of the, the room. It hears everything except for the room and zoom. Here's everything except for it's itself. So you pull that, that one fader down across that bus. And that's why we call it mix minus it's mix minus itself. Um, now you have a couple of buses that are, that are handling those things. Now, 
those are all raw channels. You can just record them all um, as individual tracks as well. So you can record the entire event, um, but then everybody only hears the other side. Now, the real challenge is not recording this or um, sending those. Those are relatively simple problems. The real problem is not having echo return. So when a person talks in Zoom, if you have open speakers in the in in, in the um, in the space, they're going to hear themselves at sometimes re, um, 100% volume uh, back into those into the microphone because the speakers are open there. So that becomes a problem if the person has open my open speakers on the other side. Some people will jump in on their laptop, and they may feed the room back to itself, which is even. And, and what's great is if both of them aren't working, they both feed back to each other, and it rings really, really loudly. Um, it's awesome. Uh, it's never happened. It's never happened to me in a, in an actual event but I've seen other people do it often. So, um, so you have to, you, one of the things that we do to solve that is we make sure that the other side either has an audio engineer that can manage it or headphones, you know, so the, the far side on zoom should, everybody should have headphones in, or we should have a, uh, an audio engineer there to manage it. Second thing is, is that what we do is use, um, an auto mix system. So we use Dugan typically, and we use the if the audio is coming out of the out of zoom we're pushing down the mics and if the mics are coming out they're pushing down zoom and so that helps to um create that it's a it's a it's more of an art than a than a technical aspect um and so it's something you really have to spend a lot of time on but you should definitely take bringing remote people into a remote people from zoom into a um session as uh you need to take it very seriously. <laughs> like it is a, it is a, it is a very complicated thing to do. Well, um, you think that you'll, the echo cancellation will work, but it won't because there's delays in the system. And once those delay systems, those delays defeat the echo cancellation. And then that's, what's really going to get you. The other parts of this is, are pretty simple. Uh, next question. Joaquin Matus from Imperial Valley, California thoughts on the black magic audio to SDI mini converters, building out a remote kit that has a need for SDI embedded audio. Any other suggestions for audio embedders? I only require two analog channels. Yeah, the audio to SDI work pretty well. Um, we usually embed them in something else. Uh, usually it's some kind of video recorder for a long time. If it's 1080p, I use the PIX240. Um, but there's other things that you might be able to use. No, I think the um, the uh, black magic assists will work as well. Uh, I like to be able to see the video and see the audio going in as it goes through. But as far as an embedding um, an embedder that that will absolutely work for two channels. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, you're mentioning the uh, the PIX 240. It's amazing how that keeps coming back. You know, you want, you know, you, I'm putting it on the shelf and the next thing I know, I'm oh, pulling it out it's such to a do great a demo mix. or do something else. It's one of the one of the most you know, classic machines ever, you know, um, it just really did, did the job very well. It had a lot of routing, so you could do a lot of things with it as far as the embedders, but yeah, these embedders and most of these, I think the audio to SDI in, in, in mini embedder, I know one of them will do up to eight channels. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and you can also, by the way, one way I was trying to look for here is that, uh, they, they now make, uh, there's, it's out there a little box about $1,600. That is the Dante to SDI embedder and D embedder. Uh, which is key to the operation because now you can just pass Dante to it and then embed it as it, or de embed as it goes through. Um, next question Chris Widener from Lafayette, Indiana. SDI Ethernet cable snakes. I'm definitely investing in the new PTZ cameras and have found cable snakes with both together for a nice clean look. I'm on the fence. Good idea, bad. What's the panel's thoughts? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, you might look into a technology called HD Base T. It's not necessarily a uh, Ethernet protocol, but it uses Ethernet cables and it runs uh, digital video and power and and uh, IP over a single Ethernet cable. Uh, it's a whole alliance of people. A few manufacturers make it, and it's used uh, for transporting high def video and up to high def uh, high def video i think they can do 4k these days uh, and even uh, ac power over an ethernet cable if you need it uh, up to a certain number of watts maybe you know 75 to 100 watts uh, at a distance so hd base t look into that and see if those uh, any of your ptz ptz cameras handle that protocol and that type of connector 
And we've definitely bound up a lot of um, different things. Like for our Ozo cameras, we used to have Ethernet and SDI and power that would all go out to them in one strand that we that we bound together. Um, a lot of power is not something you want to necessarily bundle in there, but the small amount of power that was required, I think 36 volts or 48 volts, where it was fine, and um, low amps. Um, and so, uh, so we didn't really have any issues with it, but it is nice to have all of it in one place. It's just that you're now really creating a mission-specific cable for that specific camera and um, it, it really can speed up your your rollout pretty quickly next question douglas carmichael office hours 2.0 uses mac mini units running zoom iso to extract the raw video feeds how would canvas extract four to five digits worth of video feeds from zoom um, I, I think that what we see in canvas i think that what you're talking about is how do they have all those people that are there. And I think that Canvas is actually cutting up uh, a gallery view. So it, it's only grabbing one, and that one can hold up to 49 people. And then the 49 people are fairly predictable about where they are geomet geometry wise. So if you go full screen, you know that it's this many pixels over and this many pixels down. And so what it does is it grabs each one of those as a texture map and puts them and projects them onto, not projects, but puts them onto a polygon. And so each, each face has one of those now you can just move them around anywhere you want <laughs> so but it but what it's doing to do that texture mapping that that video texture mapping in unreal or their own version of that is that it's mapping the video as a texture map and it just says i need this coordinate to this coordinate to this coordinate you know and, and just grabs onto that square but they're not grabbing at full resolution now what they do when you ask for somebody that's another computer supplying that one person who's being pinned and brought in now i i think that there's a more efficient ways to do it with Zoom ISO than the way I think that they're doing it right now. But I think that, that hopefully, I think I imagine they'll probably go that direction. But the old fashioned way would be to pin the people that you needed. The new way to do it would be to let Zoom ISO tell you you have a computer that's grabbing onto the person selected, outputting it full res, and then having it swap that into its larger polygon that, that sits there. And you can do it. A lot of times people take the gallery, and as you pull up, you're mapping the new polygon with the person in it on top of the old one so it looks like a tra it looks like a smooth transition but it's not it's uh um it's actually swapping out the high res for the low res go ahead john jesse and i did exactly what what you just articulated okay we, we brought the we brought the gallery view into unreal and then we were able to zoom people in and out and do anything we wanted once we had it in unreal that's awesome very good um next question Douglas Carmichael, and he wants to know, how do you draw the line between building confidence and encouraging your team versus creating unrealistic or inflated expectations in their minds for the outcome of a project? Go ahead, John. Yep. When you're talking about confidence, how you gain confidence is your brain gives you a shot of dopamine after doing something small that's positive. And that creates a feedback mechanism in your brain that says, oh, I should do more of that. So back when we were cave people wandering around the Serengeti, we would stumble across some berries. They tasted like sugar and sugar triggered our dopamine levels. And we'd say, ooh, I should go find some more berries. And so that's what you want to do with projects is break them into really small items and tasks and give positive feedback when the person does a good job. And that's what builds confidence over time. When you get done with a large project, you recognize that you completed a large project and your brain will give you a shot of serotonin, which is the satisfaction chemical. So basically how you draw the line is you try to make sure you give the people's brains the right chemicals to create the behavior that you want them to have. Yeah, and, and I think that um, one of the things that, that I try to do as best I can, when you, this, this whole process is an imperfect situation. You do the best you can on a lot of these things. But, but I think that um, one of the things that I tend to do is, is tap down too much expectation <laughs> you know like this is we're gonna do the best we can we'll see how this goes let's let's see let, let's see where we go here we're, we're, go, we're doing good so far um i had a i had a friend who uh he just he he had kids this is long long ago 20 years ago and he had kids that he just got upset with a lot no he didn't you know he, he didn't abuse them but he was always like you gotta you, I, you know he's always raising his voice to get them to you know get ready for school or get ready for everything turned out then you had to do that all the time <laughs> like you know because they, they don't respond they stop responding to uh anything so i try to do as little of that as possible <laughs> you know so um you know i try to uh in in most cases try to keep my my uh things that are fairly monotone when things are good i sound like this when things are bad i pretty much sound like this and when things are really bad or good then i sound different 
but but I um, do the best I can to stay in a middle middle road as much as I can as as we work through projects. Go ahead, Courtney. Now, what you do is you hire someone like me, a professional curmudgeon, to be on your team, who will constantly say, "No, nah, that's never going to work. No, nah, I, I don't think that's a good idea." And then, when the team gets it right and does it right, they they feel like they've really accomplished something because they've shown up the professional curmudgeon. Who was the what was what was the emperor who? Um, it wasn't it one of the the Caesar that had someone that always that was paid basically to be stay, walk behind him and just go, "You're only a person." You're person you're only person. you know like like you know like you know like just to remind him that, that god thought out of his brain yeah 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 exactly um yeah so you know and, and the, the bottom line is i think that one of the things that's uh a challenge is you do want people to see what the big picture is you know there's you know you want people to understand that we're building a cathedral not cutting a rock you know like it's very easy to get into this thing like i'm just building this square rock you know and i'm going to cut it and then i'll put it in the hole that it belongs in and that that can be you know you do that every day for years or you know you know a decade uh it can get pretty monotonous unless you can see that oh i'm building this giant beautiful cathedral and it might take me years to to get it done but this is part of that so there's a there's a piece of it is that you're trying to what is part of that and then the other part is to is to is to keep focused on the little successes as well go ahead john yeah and that reminded me Another thing to think about is you should always reward the thinking process and the acting process and not the results. Because a lot of times you'll, ha you'll have decided the right thing to do and things still go wrong. And you want right. to reward the, the appropriate steps instead of just how it came out. Right. And, and, you know, and a lot of it is trying to analyze what when things work, when things don't work, it's less about trying to find out who didn't do it, but what didn't happen, <laughs> what was missing, and stay really focused on the things that are, are missing and, and not worry too much about who who did that, as much as what was missing and how do we fix it and what do we put into place so that that never happens again. Um, next question. And it's from Kenneth Jones in Seattle, Washington. Current company excluded. What's one example of effective technical leadership you can recall? And why did it rise to the top of your mind just now? I go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, very interesting question because I, I, I had to think about it, and then it, whatever it is rose to the top of my mind. Uh, way back when, I worked in a uh, Philadelphia studio, and uh, one member of the uh, technical crew sort of took me aside and started explaining to me things that they're small things. They're, they were they were bits of wisdom that uh, I've been able to carry forward that nobody else bothered to do. For example. Um, how to wind a uh, cable without doing it over your arm or the proper way to use gaff tape or the proper way to pack tapes on a, a one inch tape machine. Um, I want to thank Greg Dunlap for his uh, unwavering uh, patience and pointing things out to me that were very important, very small little things, but they all added up to me not making a fool of myself. Good, Courtney. Yeah, you you probably don't know him, but the first name that came to my mind was our chief engineer at a PBS station when I was first starting in the industry back in the uh, 60s, uh, Henry Mistro. And he was a chief engineer, but he took the time. And we had a lot of, like myself, fledgling people, uh, volunteers and so on on the engineering team. And he would take the time to teach people and explain to them how stuff works. And he was not afraid if you asked a stupid question that may have been you know, pertinent, to even consider it as a possibility and not say, no, that's not how we do it, and, and to consider your suggestions. And he was one of the few people that I really looked up to about uh, engineering in general. Eric? You know, <clears throat> I work in the fiber business, and one of the most important parts of that business is outside plant, which is the building of the fiber. And I had this fantastic uh, mentor. He had spent 40, he has spent still working there 40 years in the business. And one of the things he was, he did for me, I mean, I'm in sales. And so, and he's in engineering, he's the manager of the engineering group. Um, but he actually allowed me to ask him questions constantly. And I would say, well, how does this work? I, I don't know how to sell this piece. And he would very patiently walk me through that in a way that honestly, I don't think he's done for anyone else, but I think it's mostly because no one asked. You know, nobody in the sales department. So since then, I have asked people in sales when they join, you know, they come to that area. I say, you've got to go talk to him. You've got to meet him. You've got to understand how this process works. Because once you understand how the, the work inside happens, you'll understand how to sell it. Uh, very few people have taken me up on that. But he is somebody that I will always be grateful for, for the knowledge and understanding that I built. Yeah, I think that one of the things that... Um... 
I think is important is to think about how to get that out of someone too. So someone may be, uh, you're talking to someone and whether you're nodding and, and how you, whether you're argumentative with them, whether you're, sounds like you're listening, whether you are implementing what they asked for, these are all things that will have people be either more or less interested in telling you things. Like, so when you're interested in it, when it, when you're, you know, uh, really discussing it and obviously getting it, when you're using those things and coming back with new things, um, a lot of people will perk up and, you know, take you under their wing and, and, and kind of move things along. And if you're, if you're constantly pushing back, like, well, this might be a better idea or this might be da, 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 da. like, especially when you're new, you know, what someone does who's experienced, they're like, okay, well, I don't have anything to say to you anymore. You know, like, like, you know, like, 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 and so, so, you know, it's always, it's important to absorb, you know, when you're around my, uh, my brother, uh, he's, a master of this. He, even if he knows a lot about something, he will come into everything like he doesn't know anything and sit there and talk to someone and go, wow, that's really, you know, and, and like, he'll go and talk to people at their golf course. I mean, my brother runs a golf course and he'll sit there and talk to someone about it. Like he's never run a golf course or not. You know, and he's probably one of the best in the world at what he does. And so he's, but he, he doesn't have it. Like he, he doesn't have anything to prove. He doesn't have to show them, but he showed up at Pebble beach and he was like talking to someone about it and just, just absorbing what they have. There's no reason to, to you, I think that getting yourself out of the way is a big piece of the puzzle, you know? And um, so I think that that's always important. I think that for me, when I think of the quintessential technical uh, leadership is uh, I worked, you know, actually the building that I'm in now is, was uh, John Knoll um, was a, you know, he wrote this little with his brother, he wrote this little program called Photoshop and was a um, visual effects supervisor here at Industrial Light and Magic, not here, but it used to be here in the building that I'm in at the moment. Um, and uh, the, the interesting thing about him is he's a visual effects supervisor, still did his own shots. Like he would do some of the simple shots or he would do some sometimes complex shots at his house, you know, as you do, you know, like just throwing them together. And he would come up with very, he used to do motion control. So he'd do these very motion control things to get all the, you know, and he, he mathematically just completely understood. If you want to get a sense of how much John Knoll knows, um, just look at the Mandalorian behind the scenes of them doing the physical ships. He built the whole rig, like machined it, you know, and built it out with all the motors and everything else as well as he can build photorealistic 3D models and texture them and light them and, you know, do all the things in between. Um, and what was interesting was, is that almost, I feel like I, I look back on it. I think it was, it felt like almost every week we would have some question for John and he would, he would very attentively just explain it to you. Like, like this, like there was one day we asked, how does Gaussian, Gaussian blur work? And he, you know, cause he wrote the plugin. <laughs> so, so he sat there and just, you know, he just did the math. Like it's a convolution kernel and this is how this figure, he just did, did the math of what, what the, what the setting actually means, you know? And, um, uh, and so, but it was like that every week, you know, and he, I think he just really enjoyed, um, explaining things to us when we, when we asked him to, and, uh, I, you know, I learned a lot. <laughs> in a year of, of or a year and a half of being at ILM uh, with that kind of lesson, um, oftentimes every week. Uh, next question. Kenneth Jones from Seattle, Washington. Sometimes I buy used cars. Seems like a good deal. What's the group's opinion about refurbished, that is to say used, computers? How old is too old? Good, Courtney. I've had good luck with uh, refurbished uh, computers. Now, refurbished is sometimes manufacturers refer to it as B-stock because its uh, equipment was purchased new and returned within the warranty uh, for some problem. Uh, and usually most of the problems are the person didn't know how to use it and so it didn't perform like they thought it was going to perform, so they return it. So most of that B-stock is usually just the same as the A stock. So you get a good discount. They cannot sell it as new if it's returned. So they have to sell it at a discount. So I found factory refurbs. I've bought a bunch of factory refurbs from a DVD store. So uh, I've had good luck with it. Uh, I'd, I'd stay away from stuff that has been, uh, you know, used for two or three years on someone's uh, you know, in someone's back closet or something, unless you feel like you want to restore it or put some time into checking it out and, and refurbishing it yourself. Because if it hasn't gone back through a factory refurbishment process, you don't know what's broken on it or why that person wants to get rid of it. Yeah, Courtney is uh, spot on. I mean, uh, something that's been refurbished by the factory uh, is probably better than something that came off the uh, the assembly line new because it's been run, it's been tested. So any quirky uh, behavior will have showed up by now. 
Um, the other thing that sort of makes an old thing new um, is putting uh, Linux on an older computer and finding out that uh, it runs faster than it did when you were running Windows on it. Go ahead, John. I worked in a refurbishing plant in college, and I would disagree slightly. If the item costs less than $100, I can almost guarantee there's no work done to it. People plugged it in, checked its main functionality, and then put it back into a box. Uh, as long as it has a good warranty, you should be good to go. But a lot of refurbished items are just retesting stuff that gets returned. Yeah, I, I, um, uh, I won't buy a computer to use. And, and it comes down to security issues that I have with it. Um, there's so many things that can go wrong that are hard to undo. Um, but but I, I definitely have bought some used stuff when it's, you know, basic, more more basic chipsets. <laughs> you know, I, I have a tendency to do that. I tend not to buy computers, though. I do buy lots of used cars, though, mostly BMWs. Um, I, have a, I have a thing for buying old BMWs and then running them into the ground over a decade, and then I buy another one. <laughs> so um, uh, next question. Next question from Jeff Reland from Indianapolis, Indiana. Have you all had an experience with third-party Zoom apps that will do real-time closed captioning and then allow the user to download the transcript locally, not store it in the cloud? I have not. Um, all the transcripts we've done, actually, all the transcript, all the captioning that I've done is actually with a person, um, attaching them to the to the actual event and having them caption out. Um, so I haven't actually done anything that would require that. Um, typically, if I want a transcript later, I take the audio files and I push them into something like um, uh, simonsays.ai and have it just spit out something that, that I can use later um, because it formats it with the time and it does a much, I feel like it does a much better job at making it accessible for me to actually do edits with and it's relatively not that expensive. Um, next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia. What is the proper use of Apple's time machine? as my external drive is almost full. And do I need all the backups on the drive? I never use Time Machine. <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's the way I use it. Um, I, I prefer uh, the Time Machine. Apple likes to do things automatically. And that automatic and, and backing up is something that I worry about a lot of things getting run over. And I copy things over where that in the state that I want them to be in onto a drive that I want to back up. Maybe that's not the best way to do it, but um, I have, yeah, never used the time machine. So, and I've never, you know, so um, that's, I guess that's my, my two cents. Next question. Tony Mobley again from New New Georgia. I'm in a position that my iPad Air 2020 is being returned is an issue on it. And I'm getting a refund for the iPad panel. Please advise replace iPad or get MacBook Air. The refund is less than one thousand dollars. I go ahead, Eric. You know, I'm a huge fan of the iPad. I switched to the 2018 when it came out, uh, Pro, the 2018 Pro, in place of a laptop. Um, the problem with iPad OS is that it isn't a full solution. Um, there are things you can't do with it. Although more and more, I think you can. Um, but I'm awfully fond of the touchscreen, the portability. Uh, multiple use, right? You can pull it off the keyboard if you have a keyboard. Um, so I would always say get an iPad if you don't have one and pair it with a Mac. Uh, but I will say at the same time, the M1 uh, MacBook Airs are phenomenal and worth every penny, especially right now. Um, you know, the, there there may be a possibility of an M2 coming out soon. So now you you kind of have to decide. You know, are you going to uh, you're going to go that direction? But essentially, you have to think like, what's the use? What's the majority of the use for that product? Um, but I would always say, at least have a, an iPad if you can paired with your Mac. I would get the iPad as well. Um, by the way, for our uh, our producers. <laughs> This, this panel is cutting through the questions uh, like a hot knife through butter. Uh, we're down to our last one. So if you've got questions that you, that you want us to answer, this is a good time to throw a couple more in there. Um, next question. Next question from James Babbitt in San Diego. There is a new Apple video about iPhone privacy where they're auctioning the user's data. Is there an estimate of the value of user data to the advertisers? Good, Mitchell. I find it really hard to believe because that, that breaks quite a few rules and maybe a few uh, laws um, as far as uh, repurposing that data that was on there. And um, I, because we have the time, I'll mention it. Uh, uh, right around the corner from here is a Mac repair shop. 
uh, that happened to uh, secure a laptop from a political figure, President Sun. And uh, that data was up for grabs because every possible news agency was uh, hassling him to sell it. And uh, luckily he didn't, as, as far as I know, but it also forced him out of business and the guy's gone. He's somewhere else. So that whole, it's, it, as Alex would say, that's fissionable material when you're talking about the data that, that's been collected with, without your approval or knowledge or understanding how it's going to get used. Which is pretty much how almost all the data without your knowledge or approval like if you're if you're interacted with the internet that's i mean i think that's apple's point is not so much that they're getting to your phone and pulling it off it's that you're they're stealing your data data every day go ahead courtney yeah it's called data mining and that is uh, the marketing business runs on it uh there are issues now with privacy. Privacy has become a big deal politically and every everywhere else, so that everyone likes to ensure you that your data is held private. But that doesn't mean that they don't use your data for marketing to you by that company. That may just mean that they won't sell it to somebody else outside of their company. And when they say that, if you read a lot of those uh, privacy uh, policies and their two-point type that are 30, 60 pages long, you know, uh, you'll find that uh, they won't sell it outside the company means that they will provide it to all of their uh, partners that are part of that company. That company may may be, you know, Viacom may own 60 different companies, and they'll share that marketing data with all 60 of their sub-companies. So you got to be careful about that. And what iPhone sells, you really don't know who they're selling it to. You just have to either give it up. And marketing data, uh, data mining can be used positively. I mean, medicine, it's used uh, anonymously to, to generate uh, more information and increase the accuracy of drugs and, and drug programs. So it's, um, you know, there's a positive side to it other than just trying to sell you more widgets. Yeah, one of the things about this is that the data mining gets much deeper than I think most people get their head around. And so they think, well, Facebook is is paying attention to what I search for on Facebook, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, basically, with Facebook tracking bits, um, we get to identify where you're going all over the internet. Um, and that's one of the things. And then that is cross-checked with other things. What, what are your purchases? Where do you go? When you start mixing your location data, like what you're searching for, or what you're looking at when you're at Whole Foods or Safeway or, or wherever that is, um, what, where do you buy your gas? Where do you buy your, you know, all of those things are being com compiled into one large data map of each person, which, which makes it more, makes the advertising far more accurate um, and make sure that you're getting what, what you're, um, uh, so, so I think that, that, that is a, it's, it's not just that it's data mining a small, <laughs> it's not just that they're, that they're taking something from your phone. They're mining everything about you all the time. And Apple is slowly tighten what Apple is marketing and what they're, you know, what they're talking to is that they are, um, they are slowly tightening that process and slowly cutting the advertisers out. So they're slowly t turning off that they, they could do it all at once, but then everyone would be upset and there'd be new laws and everything else. And so what you're watching is this kind of slow, just pulling, just pulling pins out where allowing people to have data for someone that's on their phone. And they're doing it in a way that, and I'm just kind of talking a little extra since we have a little extra time. They're, they're doing it in a way that, that, it, at the beginning of this, especially, it looks obvious, like, oh, I would never want to give that data up, or, oh, no, I never want to do that. And, and so Apple's just slowly pulling it off, and it makes the advertisers look bad when they complain about it, you know, because it's, it, it, you know, they're saying, well, we need all this data. And they're like, do you? <laughs> do you need that data? And, and so that, that is the, um, the thing that is, uh, and it's definitely blinding the companies over time. It's not what they find you searching on on their own website. They still get that, data, that first party data. Um, but what they, really want and what really sharpens the edge of, of their marketing is all the, the compendium of data. And if Apple starts cutting a lot of those pieces out, not giving location data, not giving um, your search data, not giving your login data, not giving, you're, you're basically taking the one thing that keeps track of all these things, your phone, and taking it out of the mix and not allowing you to have that, which is for us as consumers, I, I will argue that it's good for us to not be constantly attacked by it. Because I, I, I literally think that the better the advertising gets, the, there's a lot of psychologists or, will, that will tell you, your brain can only make so many decisions a day. Like it just gets tired. And then it starts making bad decisions and oftentimes impulsive decisions. 
when the marketing is too accurate, it's actually making your brain make a decision. Ooh, that looks interesting. No, I don't want to do that. Ooh, that looks interesting. And the closer it gets to you, so it's actually taxing your brain from everything else and making you more likely to buy things um, because you're, you just run out of decisions, you know, as, as it goes. And so targeted ads are horrible for you. <laughs> like, like then they shouldn't exist. And, 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 uh, and, and so um, they're, they're just bad for you psychologically over a long period of time. It's making people crazy and depressed. And so, so it is, it, it, it's not, so the Apple's slowly unwinding that, that loop for people who are at least using Apple products. Go ahead, Nate, Eric. Yeah, I was just going to say that one of the, one of the problems that still exists is the wireless carrier in that mix is the wireless carrier still knows where you are and they still know which towers you go to and they still understand kind of the the type of traffic that you're using especially because they're the ones that are feeding it to you if you're on their network and i think in the long run that's also going to be something that has to be addressed is what do you do with these wireless carriers that don't seem like they have a problem with selling your data and i think it can be done with the phone but you, st you start to have to figure out you know ways around these um Lar I mean, it's it's all dollar driven, right? So the, the more money they can make off of it, the better. Uh, so I would just say, you know, I always pay for for apps that have no advertising or as little advertising as possible. I'd love my kids to grow up in a world without understanding what advertising is. And for the most part, I would say that's that's the case. Um, but uh, that's I think it's it's one way to like you were saying, Alex, is clear, kind of clearing your mind of all those things that are showing up. But those those pesky uh, wireless carriers, those are going to be. Um, there's going to be a challenge to overcome. Unless, unless Apple decides to do something about that too. That yes. Well, that's, that's what I'm kind of getting at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'd love to see that. Yeah, me too. Uh, next question. Albi Lopez from San Antonio, Texas with all these projects. OH has, uh, what are some of the project management software that you would recommend? Uh, John. Your project management software should be the size you need it to to complete the project. I don't know about the office hour specific projects, but what I find almost as effective as a giant project management software like a Microsoft Project is just a good spreadsheet that clearly out outlines when something's due, who's responsible for it, and what the deliverable is. I have to say that the most thing, the most used thing that in the last 10 years for us has been Google Sheets. <laughs> so I mean that the, now a lot of times we source everything, I source everything in numbers. So I go into numbers because number building spreadsheets from scratch is about 10 times faster in Google numbers than it is in or not Google numbers, Apple numbers, but 10 times faster than Excel or, or, or um, Sheets. But once you make it, then we put it up on sheets so everyone can share it. <laughs> so you, you are, my sheets, mine often look very different because they have they were sourced from numbers and then put into into sheets. Um, but numbers, the collaboration tools and numbers is limited. Next question. Eric Price from Kansas City, uh, USA. As a non-audio guy, how do I know how many buses a mixer has? Is it based on the number of different outputs? Go ahead, Courtney. And you stand by the driveway and you see how many buses go out in the morning. No, in, in most analog mixers, uh, it used to be easy because you could just check the number of outputs, like you say. Because uh, if you could assign a uh, an in, one of the input channels to a separate bus, there'd be a button on each input channel to assign it, you know, left, right, or uh, three and four, or four and five. And there would be sub buses where you could gather things together and then add them to the mix uh with a secondary number of faders, like you a lot of times have four separate buses you could route things to and submix them before you add them into the main mix. With digital mixers, you know, all bets are off. Everything, you, you can bust together or group together many, many different inputs and mix to many different uh, aux sends. And you may have four outputs, but you may have internally 10 or 20 different buses you can route things to and then submix them together and send them to an output. So with digital routing and most digital mixers, you can't necessarily tell how many buses there are by looking at the panel. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think a simple answer, of course, Courtney is right, um, is the, the number of outputs that can have independent inputs assigned to is the simple and quick answer. Next question. Next question from Chad Lafarge in Columbia, Missouri. What's something you learned the hard way? Do you learn better when the lesson hurts a little? Go ahead, Courtney. No, and it's very embarrassing you know, when the lesson hurts a lot. Uh, one thing I learned is <clears throat> check your voltages 
before you plug something in. Even if you're on a professional stage with professional electricians, sometimes they mess up and put 220 into a 110 lunchbox stage box. And if you're doing a computer commercial and you plug in those computers to what's provided to you as AC with normal 110 volt uh, plugs on it and it happens to be sending 240 volts out to it it blows the little MOV resistor inside your power strip which then removes all protection from that power strip and sends 240 volts to the power supplies which blows the internal fuses in them making all of your computers useless for the day unless you take them apart and replace the internal fuses so that's what I learned the hard way <laughs> go ahead Mitchell uh, Chad, interesting question. It also explains why I'm still single. <laughs> uh, Eric? You know, um, I have three little kids. And so um, lessons I learned the hard way happen just about every single day. Uh, most of the time it has to do with uh, some sort of food or building Legos, um, not spending enough time with them. And I think that's what I have learned specifically about people as when studying my children is you have to get down to their level and you have to understand exactly what they're telling you. And then if you can understand that, you can communicate back to them that you understand it. And amazingly, kids seem to... They only care that you understand. They may not care that you say yes or no, um, although sometimes they do. But a lot of times, it's they understand exactly what you're telling, what you're, what they're telling you, and and that can be very important. I, th I found that if they if they tell you they want cookies, they they do want a yes or no. They they don't want to know that you that okay. you know that they want cookies. <laughs> Go ahead, John. <laughs> One lesson I learned the hard way is if there's no hot water and the room smells a lot like protein, propane don't turn on the pilot light. Uh, the other thing I learned the hard way was about half the world is social and your career is as much about building good relationships as it is getting good results. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that, um, I don't know, I feel like I everything I've learned is from the hard way. <laughs> you, know, you know, and you do the best you can. I, a lot of what I try to do is do as many tests and, and really define things as tests so I can try to learn them. Um, I was... Uh, was told a saying a long time ago, I mean, almost 40 years ago now, uh, that you can you can bleed in the barracks or bleed in the battlefield. <laughs> it's a lot easier to fix it when it's in the barracks. <laughs> so so you know so I think about that a lot. <laughs> you know so so um, of, of figuring out uh, you know trying to figure out where where I'm going to make the mistakes. I usually try to keep it in the barracks. Uh, next question. And from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia, can the panel recommend a dock to use with the iPad 2020? Please share the link if possible. Go ahead, Eric. So I use this thing. It's called a hyperdrive. It actually plugs in USB-C, so it'll work with the 2020 for sure. It has these little ports on the side, has an SD card, has a USB 3, it has another USB -P, uh, USB C port. Uh, they have a new model that actually has buttons on it, which will control your audio, which I think is really kind of a neat little addition. Um, this is about eighty dollars, I believe, and you can find it at, the, at Hyperdrive's uh, website. And if you're if you're talking about a dock, and you're talking about the twenty twenty, you should always get the uh, keyboard. Now, it's not exactly it. It just creates such a great experience that uh, I would always get the Magic Keyboard for an iPad Pro, the ones that support it. You go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I think that has a USB-C on it, as Tony indicates. Uh, yeah, uh, um, a good hub, uh, anything that OWC sells. I mean, it's just a good place to go. You can get different sizes. I like that gadget that Eric just showed us. Next question. Next question from Eric. Uh, Eric Nathan in Bellingham, Washington. What do you see for the future of broadcast TV? Is YouTube the future replacement medium? Is there still room for over-the-air delivery? Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yes, ATSC3 is the next transmission standard for broadcast television, and it's going to include interactivity and video on demand and IP. It's basically a, uh, an IP-based Delivery uh, services supports HEVC, 120 frames per second, wide color gamut, high dynamic range. So uh, broadcast TV is not going away, despite the fact that you may think it is. Uh, go ahead, Dan Mitchell. Yeah, what Courtney just said, and the fact that uh, over the air means uh, it's a it might be a better connection uh, where ha wherever you happen to be, or maybe you just don't have the money to spend on wireless and cable TV and all that stuff. John. It's an interesting question. I watch my children 
none of them have TVs in their room. They all watch YouTube all day long. Yeah. Eric? Yeah, I was going to say that. That's exactly the experience I've had. Um, I will tell you a story. Uh, I used to drive Uber. And uh, this was a few years ago where um, I was in a car and I was picking up a college student and uh, we started talking about, you know, watching television. And he was saying, oh, he didn't have enough money. And I said, why don't you get an antenna and you can plug it into your TV? And he said, is that legal? And I thought, <laughs> there's a generation that doesn't even know it exists. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I, I kind of think, yeah, there might be new standards, but there's this generation that's just going to grow up into never having seen it and don't really care. So that's why I asked. Yeah, I find that um, my issue, I think, is also that I just don't like the linear nature anymore. I, I don't like the that I have to wait for the next thing. I mean, I'm so used to just like on I have YouTube, I have YouTube TV. And I have record on anything. I have like records set for everything, you know. And so, um, so I've got this giant collection of things. And if I feel like watching something, I just watch the specific thing that I wanted to watch. I don't really have a the idea that I would just turn a channel on and and have it do the thing, um, you know. So I think that that's a um, it's a very interesting puzzle at, at this point of being able to deliver something more on demand. Um, I know that my kids just you watch YouTube. <laughs> like they, you know, they, they're, that's, that's pretty much their entire existence. Uh, next question. Uh, from Jeff Vreeland in Indianapolis, Indiana. Following up for Alex on closed captioning, do you have a service you use for hiring a person to do the closed captioning? Yeah, we use first, uh, caption first. Uh, they're, they're out of, I think, Kansas, I believe. Um, and uh, they, um, that's who we've used for a long time. And they sort out finding captioner, captioners all over the mostly over the United States. Next question. From Laura Thompson in Texas. The university wants me to try Mac OS for the accessibility. I'm good with the idea, but after 20 years on Windows, what should I know to get going quickly? I used Mac in high school, but if it was a pre OS 10. To get back to YouTube, how I learn everything nowadays is I have a YouTube window open on an iPad or another computer and I'm trying to learn something and I just literally search for, I don't understand how to do this. I don't understand how to do that. I don't understand how to do this. And there's some, somebody, it's kind of an amazing thing. Somebody has done a video about it. And, um, and so I, and I just look at the video and then I go do that thing. I go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. If you're going to switch into the Mac world, learn how to live with limitations <laughs> because uh, you've got a single manufacturer that makes the only hardware. And so if there's something that you need or something that somebody has come up with and it doesn't run on the uh, Mac, you're going to be stuck because there's probably not a way to run it. Unless you can run. One good thing is uh, on many of the Intel Macs, at least, you can run Windows on it if there's some piece of software that you need for accessibility that doesn't run uh, in Mac OS X, you can a lot of times run Parallels and run a virtual Windows machine on it and still have access to it and use it on your Mac. So that's the good point about that. I go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I was in that position not too long ago. Um, I had been a Windows user forever, and I moved to the iPhone, and then I moved to the iPad. And then when the M1 came out, I said, oh, man, that looks really tempting. And it looks very similar to the iPad, so I wanted to move over to it. And all I did was go to YouTube. And I, I, MacMost, I think it's been mentioned before, MacMost is a really interesting YouTube channel, really basic, and just kind of steps you through from very basic ideas to very complex ideas. Uh, I also got into watching MacBreak Weekly which I, I'm those sure somebody have, would... Those guys are crazy. <laughs> right, crazy. <laughs> don't, don't Absolutely crazy. Say. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I would say um, it definitely has a lot more features that I've enjoyed um, over Windows, and but I'm more than willing to let Apple make the hardware and not have it uh, come from anyone else. Next question. Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh, PA. What is the most economical but high-quality 4K to 1080p downscaling options? Apparently, EDID options use line skipping process. The only success that I've had is using monitors that will do it internally. You know, so if they don't have it, they're going to make that scaler um, internal. I haven't seen it again for the, um, uh, I mean, there's definitely ones out there that will do those. These are like the decimator 4Ks, the, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, Terranexes, et cetera. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was just going to mention the Terranexes because they're very good at that algorithm that they've done is very good at scaling. 
and uh, they have the mini Terranexes now from Blackmagic Design that you can get uh, that are fairly reasonably priced and, and are quite capable of changing things. But the Decimator is, is great for changing frame rates as well as scaling. Yeah, and I, and I don't know of anything below a Decimator, tw- um, the Decimator 4K, that I don't, think, I don't know of anything that costs less that doesn't do some kind of every other line type of, type of uh, tr- transformation. Next question. Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Can we send 1080 footage through Wirecast to a Zoom webinar and get 1080 out, or will it be limited to 720? I think it. if you have a 1080 account, you should be able to, um, uh, you, you, you should be able to take the monitor out of Wirecast or the web output, I believe, and do that. But I'm not 100% certain. I haven't used Wirecast in a little while, but it should, should work. Um, there should be a 1080 out of Wirecast that should make that work. Um, but you have to make sure that your Zoom account is set to 1080. That's the harder part. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks a question. Back in 1983, AT&T Western Electric said that the 5ESS switch and ISDN would change the world. It took a competitive market to build the broadband networks we see today. If North America still had the Bell system, where would we be? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, well, actually, ISDN is still around. Uh, we still sell DS0 circuits. Uh, DS0s are analogs, which are uh, still in the same family. But I will say, um, I think we have a less competitive market than we should. Um, that is one thing that is missing in a lot of areas is real competition amongst carriers. And I think finally we've arrived at a place where now wireless carriers are getting into the business. And I think that's a good thing. It's a good thing for forever. I'd hate to see one single cable company be a monopoly. I live in an area like that where you have the telephone company, which delivers like a megabit and the cable provider can do a gigabit. Um, but that doesn't encourage the cable provider to actually provide that great a service. And I think that it's really important to have more of that kind of, of uh, competition now, because otherwise we are not going to be able to have uh, the kind of robust change that you're talking about. So if it was the Bell system, I'd say we'd, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> Good, Courtney. Yeah, I'd say we'd all be broke because you'd have one person, one company that's in charge of all the transmission of data, and that's not a good comp- competitive uh, situation. It used to be quite a bit different when it was all point-to-point connections. You know, when you know you had to go through a switch at the telephone company, it would actually connect your telephone wire to somebody else's telephone wire through a bunch of relay links down the line, and it was all analog. <clears throat> and they owned all the wires, and they owned the poles that the wires were on. And if anybody competitors had to come in, they couldn't put up another pole because uh, they had to lease space off the pole of the people who owned those poles, and usually it was the telephone companies. Same thing for cable TV. So it was very anti-competitive, but now that there's a universal method of transmission and there's wireless transmission and there's satellite transmission that doesn't necessarily depend on poles and right-of-way and land ownership, that it, it can be much more competitive. And, and I think even though it takes a lot of money to put those satellites up and it's going to limit itself naturally to just a few companies, so it's going to limit competition quite a bit. Yeah, pole access is a big deal. Like I, I, have, I have friends that have an ISP, and... I'm of the opinion that the um, the who the pole access you technically have a right to get pole access, and, and but what a lot of folks do is they'll delay it for a decade to keep you behind. Um, I think that if uh, they were fined a hundred thousand dollars a pole per month that they were late, they get thirty days to give you the pole access, and then after that they're fined a hundred thousand dollars a month per pole. Um, they would figure it out. It would be amazing how quickly, and we would have suddenly a lot of competition, which is why they don't want to do it, of course. And of course, our telecommunications uh, industry, uh, um, you know, they they spend a lot of money in Congress <laughs> to, to make sure that we don't uh, that we don't ask these questions very often. Um, so this is this is probably one of the key aspects of it is is there's an enormous amount of money flowing into Washington D.C. Uh, from the telecommunications ag- agencies. Um, and a lot of deals that get done with the NSA and so on and so forth to uh, the um, to to keep it in place. <laughs> so we, I don't talk about politics very often, but because it relates to what we do, uh, we have to know that this, this is a government issue, not a not a uh, you know competition issue. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, a, a good case for me was I'm a radio guide, and I used to use ISDN for communications. That's the bonded 56k uh, pair. 
And ISDN and DSL being pretty much the same, and like Courtney said, point to point in, in some senses, at least to the last mile, um, was forced out of business by IP-based systems. And um, the, re the way they got us out of using it is they just r kept raising the price on ISDN until it was a horrible. It was like three times what I pay now for a, a decent-sized uh, cable uh, connection. So... Um, it, yeah, I guess it's market pressures, uh, politics, as you just mentioned, and things like that that uh, move, you know, uh, along. And like I said, ISDN will just be an ancient memory for many of us. One more question for the first hour. Okay. And it's coming in from Seth Graham in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm seeing 4K uploads to YouTube taking upwards of two days to process. The videos average one to two hours in length. Is there an ideal compressor preset or setting that help the YouTube process the 4K file any faster? It really depends on how much is being there. It's got to process it anyway, so it doesn't matter what you process it as when you upload it, I mean, within range. I will find, I do find, that H.264 has a tendency to um, compress better because you have uh, done the quantization that the quantization um, of, the, of the image, and you get more what you expect. So. What I put up things that have been compressed at H.264 and the exact thing up uploaded as ProRes, and I'm actually happier with the H.264 uh, transcode than I am with the ProRes transcode. And that is, I believe, I have a theory about this, and that is that that um, YouTube, you know, basically is middle of the road um, compression. If, if you give it a lot of data, it's doing the best it can for everything. If you pre-encode it and already limit its options, it just sticks with that is, um, a lot more than if you give it something with a lot more options. Um, so I actually find that YouTube uh, is, um, you know, you don't, you, you get a higher quality if you've done the compression ahead of time. Go ahead, Mitchell. Where's that uh, sweet spot in terms of the uh, frames per second? That, uh, that you're limited to at two six frames per second. Yes, not frame per second. Um, uh, the data um, limit. Uh, yeah. The, so so bit tip, Yeah, bit rate. I mean, I, I usually upload something that's been compressed to about eight megs. You know, so about eight megs a second. I, I that that tends to be where I would kind of target. Um, for now, for 4K, I, I would probably do more like fifteen or twenty megs a second. Um, but for 1080P, I would do. Um, Eight megs. Now, the other thing is, is that you, the 4K just takes, a, you know, four times as much processing, especially a couple hours that you're mentioning here. Um, so it's not, it would be a, it's a lot of processing and that gets pushed oftentimes to a, a limited number of processors um, that are available to do that. So if there's a large glut of people trying to do the same thing, it takes longer. All right. We are now jumping into the second hour. Um, of this and and uh, we have we're going to talk a little bit again on a lot of these hours we're going to be talking about presentations and process because i think it's important um, we may insert other things in there right now you know as we go but uh, but um, oftentimes we're going to be talking about these things because i think it's a really important skill set and today we're going to talk about um, making a, a slide better <laughs> like how do we actually do this and and before you go okay well this isn't really i mean this is just slide decks or powerpoint um just remember that you know most things that get funded uh you, many companies talk about the fact that everything's a deck or a demo so you can either show you something working or you have a deck that tells people how it works and people who are good at decks that have that are not very good at anything else getting an awful lot of things go their way because they're able to build a good deck and able to clearly outline what they're trying to do and what's possible. So it's a really, really important skill, probably more important than most people think because I look at their decks and they're horrible. <laughs> so so, um, so John's gonna help us a little bit um, and uh, talk a little bit about how to update the slides and answer your questions. And if you have questions about uh, what um, we're talking about related to slides um, uh, or, um, uh, or just slide decks in general, uh, go ahead and throw those questions into Makana right now. So John, why don't you take it away? All right. Yeah. And today I wanted to really focus on busy slides. We always talk about your slides. Which is be the simple. worst slide. The, the worst slide is the busy <laughs> right. slide. Your, and I saw three slide decks this week from companies that are very large and everyone would recognize the names of the companies that were just poorly designed. Um, since we're in the education hour, also on Saturdays, I wanted to make it fun. And we've been talking a lot about dinosaurs. So I'm going to use some dinosaurs as examples to show you two and a half different techniques I use all the time to bring focus on a busy slide. 
Uh, to do that, I'm going to share my screen. And I'll be using both PowerPoint and Keynote today because you can use either tool. And um, there's a few things you can only do in one or the other. And let me move my toolbar. So I'll try to point out what those things are as I go along. And so in my screen right now, you see my PowerPoint of uh, a dinosaur. And you can see I have lots of different dinosaurs on my screen. And if I really want to, in an educational context, focus on one or two of these dinosaurs, all of these techniques I'll use today are going to use basically masks and Boolean tools to highlight things. So what we're going to be doing is putting a transparent dark box over the top of our whole slide and then use different techniques to cut out the things we want to focus on to really bring highlights to specific parts. Uh, in my slide here, again, I use a quick access toolbar, so I have uh, quick access to the tools I use all the time. I'll start by drawing a rectangle. And your rectangle needs to be at least as big as your slide. Key on your rectangles, make sure you remove any outlines. Uh, I can show you why if you'd like, but it'll highlight what you're trying not to highlight. Make my full fill black, and now obviously I can't see anything on my slide. In PowerPoint, if you want to change the transparency of an object, it's going to be in your shape fill options, and you'll have to choose more fill colors. And I always like, I think about 70, 70, between 70 and 75% opacity is usually pretty good. Next, I'll duplicate, duplicate this slide. And you can already start to see, I'm going to go from a bright slide with all my dinosaurs to a dark slide. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to cut out each of these dinosaurs so that they'll shine through. Uh, before I do that, for editing sake, this T-Rex is a little too dark for me. So I'm going to once again change my opacity. I'll, I'll change it back to 70% when I'm done. But sometimes it's easier to see. I'm going to make it way lower. One thing I like about Keynote better is the opacity slider is way better. So next what I need to do is I need to cut a T-Rex shape out of this gray rectangle. To do that, you're going to draw a shape. And both PowerPoint and Keynote have a shape that allows you to draw your own points on the shape. It's called the freeform tool. And in PowerPoint, you can just sort of drag, click and drag your mouse. And this is going to be really shoddy work. Uh, normally, I would spend, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes just on this T-Rex shape to get it nice and tight. But you'll understand uh, what I'm doing here. And you don't want to see me fiddle with my points. And I'm running out of mouse space, but I have just enough. When you close your freeform shape, you'll see I'm going to cut out this T-Rex shape from my whole picture. To do that, I first select the image that I want to cut out from, hold down shift and collect, select the image I want to cut out. Then I can use my Boolean tools to subtract the T-Rex shape. And remember how I said, oh, make sure you don't have your outlines turned on. You can see I have a nice black outline around my T-Rex and I want to get rid of that as well. And that outline is actually coming from my large gray rectangle. So I select my large gray rectangle, choose no outline, and that line will go away. Get them back in my rectangle, back into my fill colors, crank that opacity back up to 75%. And my second slide is going to look like this. So I'm going to go from seeing all my dinosaurs to focusing just on the T-Rex. To make a nice transition, I'm going to use the morph transition in PowerPoint. One difference between PowerPoint and Keynote. In Keynote, you actually put the transition on the first slide. In, in PowerPoint, you put it on the second slide and show you what that slide looks like. So I could be teaching my class saying, today, class, we're going to be talking about dinosaurs. We're going to start talking about all of our carnivores. And now I could have some text, some stats about my T-Rex come up here in a separate text box, something like that. But what you're paying attention to is the brightest part of my screen, which right now is this T-Rex. Obviously, I did a, a poor job drawing my, my shape around my T-Rex. Um, I'll show you another quick way you can draw shapes. I just, um, oops, let me redo that. And one thing I forgot to do is I should have duplicated my slide before I cut the shape out of it. 
And you can do the same thing with multiple shapes on a slide. So I'm going to grab another rectangle, draw it again. It didn't let me draw it. So I'll just repeat myself here and I'll go pretty quick. One really nice thing about this particular technique is once you learn how to use your freeform tools, it goes pretty quick uh, because you can either click and drag like I just did, or you can just click on the main points of a, one of these dinosaurs and draw roughly the shape you're looking for. And what you can come do later is edit the individual points that you're trying to edit. turn these lines into curves. So if you select a multi-shape, you right click on it and say edit points. I can right click on each point and turn this into like a curve. And then I could really have fine grained control over this particular curve and make it match that um, dinosaur really closely. Once again, I'm gonna cut this shape out and change the fill of my black shape. It's really important if you do this to keep the same percentage on each of your slides, otherwise it will be obviously a mismatch. Put that morph transition on. So we can talk, first we can talk about our carnivores and then we can talk about our herbivores. And you can do this, you know, if you're doing, for example, a layout of an ATEM Mini, you could do the same thing to highlight certain buttons on your ATEM. You can do the same thing if you have a big corporate slide and you want to just have a nice visual image and then have text slide over the top of it, just mask it with a semi-transparent shape and it makes a huge difference. And, and whether we're, you know, when we talk about this, you know, it, this is a very classic kind of filmmakers <laughs> type of thing, which is that we want to control what you're looking at. When you build a busy slide, you have no control. You are, they are wandering around, they're reading a bunch of things, they're in, they're having a new set of thought processes. Everybody's not, you know, you're not keeping everybody synced together um, when you do that. So it's, it's an incredibly important thing as you think about these things. What, what John is showing is just key to, I want you to think about this thing. And then I want you to think about that thing while I'm talking. And that's going to make it much more interesting. It's also going to, you know, let you control the narrative there. Right. You want to direct their attention to what you want them to look at, not what they're naturally going to be drawn to. Now, this is an example of the exact same feature done exactly the same way in Keynote. Um, and I'll show you where one difference that I didn't I learned about when building this presentation. Um, you can see I spent a little a little bit more time in Keynote drawing out those uh, dinosaur shapes. But notice when I go from my T-Rex slide into my Triceratops slide in Keynote, for some reason it hides my mask and then redraws it. And I think that's because it has a different shape cut out of the two. It just doesn't quite work the same. So as I was working on Keynote, I was trying to think, well, how would I do this in real life to get the same effect to draw someone's attention and highlight a specific part on a slide and make it look nice? And some of the things that Keynote's really good at, much better than PowerPoint, is some of the natural transitions in animation. So I thought to myself, maybe I can do use the same principles and Keynote's power for animation to make something that looks prettier. And here's what that might look like. So again, I have the same slide. And once again, I'm going to draw that same uh, semi-transparent box over my slide. Now in Keynote, it's really nice because you have in your uh, format tab, you can just change your opacity right over here. Actually, I'm going to use a different slide so you guys don't get so bored of the same dinosaur picture. Was this all inspired by prehistoric world? Yes. Can we know? Because <laughs> we've been talking a lot in the education oh hours about dinosaurs and how yeah. to teach dinosaurs. Um, and then that prehistoric, prehistoric world. There's not a lot of images on Google image search that have a lot of variety of dinosaurs, unfortunately. Okay, so I did the exact same thing. I've just got a semi-transparent black box. This time, my second shape, instead of drawing a dinosaur shape, I'm just going to take a circle 
and cut a spotlight out. So I'm going to cut out this pterodactyl to start. And what I will say, if you're going to do this technique, you really want your rectangle, your black rectangle, to be much, much, much larger than the slide underneath. And I'll show you why. I don't know if that's big enough. Should be close. So we're going to take my rectangle, then select my circle. In Keynote, it's under the Arrange tab. I'll subtract. And so you have a nice spotlight. Duplicate my slide. And use the magic move transition. Oh, sorry, it has a magic move on it. So what this looks like so far is again, we have our dinosaurs and I want to focus on one single dinosaur. I got a nice spotlight effect. I'm going to change my opacity of my rectangle just a little bit more. Okay. Now where it starts getting really cool is when you add additional slides. So maybe my second slide I want to focus on this Triceratops. And this is why you need the, oops, sorry about that. Didn't hold the shift down. This is where making sure your rectangle is large enough makes a huge difference because you need room for that mask to fit around the whole slide when you're moving it. And just resizing the shape I can go from my pterodactyl to my triceratops. And it makes a really nice transition into focus on my triceratops. With Keynote, you can also, and you could do the same with PowerPoint, in the background, you can actually resize the image as well. So on my third slide, I'm going to highlight one of my smaller dinosaurs, but I want them big on the screen. So I'll just resize my dinosaur picture. Then I'll resize my black rectangle. And so now what we have is a really nice smooth animation between my different dinosaurs. And because I changed the size of the image beneath, it zooms and pans uh, as I move my magic move, which looks really cool, I think. And, and this is much beyond what a lot of times you see on a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> Usually what we see is this picture with a ton of text over right. it. Right. <laughs> you just you know, more like, and more text on it. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me grab my object view. Oh, I already had it up. I also made these four buttons that you can see. And I want to bring Okay, I, was, I just want to point out that I was uh, today years old when I knew that the object view existed. <laughs> I've been using Keynote for a long time. You pop that open, I was like, what? How do I get this forward? That's what I want. Well, I'll just copy paste them. Oh, they were already forward. That's funny. Okay, so I just built these rectangles and I spaced them out as I was practicing last night. Um, what you can also do in PowerPoint or Keynote is you can build a shape. These are just text boxes, or actually they're boxes with text inside of them. And you can link any shape, whether it's visible or invisible, to another slide. So if I'm building a training material and it's going to be something I drive, I'll put the slides in the order I want to go through them. But maybe you want to have something interactive or ask your class, which dinosaur do you want to talk about first? Or your client, which of these features is the most important to you? And you can just create a clickable button by selecting the item, right clicking, and you're going to add a link. You can link to a specific slide. So I'm going to link to my pterodactyl slide. So that's slide number five in this case. A Patasaurus slide, I'll add another link. I don't know if this is an Apatosaurus, but it's a dinosaur with a long neck. So please, in the comments, if you know, if this is a Brontosaurus, please forgive me. Oh, and I didn't do a Stegosaurus, so I won't add that link. And my Triceratops slide is slide number six. I'm going to copy my buttons. 
And if you copy and paste between slides, all your buttons will keep the same exact position. So that's why I'm doing this near the end. And now what I've made, instead of just a busy slide of dinosaurs, I actually have an interactive display where I can say, well, let's talk about uh, the Triceratops. Oops, I linked it to the wrong slide. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so I can link to my pterodactyl. If we want to talk about the apatosaurus instead, I can zoom to that. And you can go in any order because the magic of Magic Move is Keynote will just find the slide you want and make it a seamless transition, no matter what order you have. So this is and a you really could nice easily way. have that in that slide. You could also have a transition against time, so it would go to the triceratops, and then right. and then text could appear. So it's really an interactive. Like you could click on the things that that are you know click on something that could give you a bunch of information. You could have it clickable. You could have it timed. All sorts of ways that you can have this technique or any of these techniques can do the same thing. One thing I really like to do is um, on my slide I'll put invisible boxes as long as they're on the top layer, and then you can um, have, for example. If I was on this slide, I could draw an invisible box around my pterodactyl and click on it and have it zoom to that pterodactyl. So that's another easy way. And those are two really similar techniques. You just take a semi-transparent box, put it on top, and then cut a hole out of it. Can you have a soft edge on that cutout? Ooh, that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I, I don't think you can. One, one of my, uh, I'm kind of surprised that with all that Keynote does, it doesn't have any anything that is like a convolution kernel based composite. So you can't do blurs, you can't do that type of thing. And it seems like nowadays with today's Macs, it would be relatively easy to do. Um, but it, you know, it doesn't say it, some of the transitions do those things. So the, the, the engine itself is capable of it, but it doesn't give us the option to blur things, which is a little bit of a bummer. Um, what you could do is you could build that highlight as a you know, have a little bit of a gradient to it as a mask. And then I think you could, you could probably, it wouldn't be the same Boolean function. You, what, what I would do with that, if I wanted it to be soft is I'd build that frame much larger in Photoshop, you know, with a, with a thing, with a, a blurred circle. And then I would do kind of what John was doing. It's not as elegant as what John's doing, but it would be a, you know, so that, that would be one big mat with, and I'd probably make it really large and put that circle in the center and blur it and then just kind of move it to where it needs to go and it would be soft. You know what you could do? I've not tried this, but there's no reason you couldn't just um, take a circle and I would want to do this before I cut it out so that they're exactly aligned. And then you could, um, do something like this, just pretend like I had this more, more accurate. And if I did a gradient fill here, um, I'm not super familiar with the gradient. A radiant, the uh, a radial gradient. Oh, click, click on the, um, Where's click that on at? that, on the color. Uh, yeah, radial make that, um, let's see here. I click away from that. I'm, I think that I could do this in PowerPoint. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, maybe it's try advanced. advanced. Yeah. Yeah, this is more what I'm thinking of. Yeah, and then you click on the second one, it'll be radial, I think. Oh, look at you. And then make this really transparent. And if you chose the right colors, you could get really close to what you're talking about, Courtney. And if you move the center point of that uh, uh, gradient, uh, you'll it'll get more feathery toward the edges. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, a lot of good. no, uh, uh, oh, yep. no. That if you um, in the in the little selector. In fact, I think you can probably add. Yeah, if you pull that in so that it turns black before it gets to the edge. So no, uh, no, no. Yeah, keep pulling that in so that it turn. It'll. Don't worry this about one? where it's at. Yeah, yeah. Just pull that in. Whoop, whoop, a little bit further out. Okay, and then um, you might need to make that circle just a little bit bigger so that it, it overlaps the the mask. There we go. Whoops, you had it there. That might be a little too much. It has to. It, this will be a kind of a precision op operation, which may not. Anyway, and then um, you go back to the see where the the slider is and the advanced right under advanced gradient. Grab that slider and just drag it. Yep, and that's gonna. What makes it more of a pinpoint? Yeah, so that that's gonna set the center point of that gradient. Um, 
And if you really want to have control over it, it's a really good idea. I've never seen anybody do this before. Um, you can click between those two boxes and it should give you another box. Right, there you go. A third and so now you could, now you could control it. Um, you'd have more control over that, you know, that, um, lens, so to speak. Like for instance, you may want to, um, make that, that box that's dark. I don't know if it's going all the way to black. Is it going all the way to black? Uh, the little, yeah, that one. No, it's not quite all. I make it all the way black. That way it, because the goal would be to get it to feed. There you go. Pull it all the way. Oh, it's because it's a 70, the same opaque or opacity. What I right. think is going to be the problem is, and where you would really want it to be exact is we get this extra dark ring around it, which I don't think is desirable, but I think there's something there. I think that if you made it a hundred percent, you made the other, let's see here. Um, is that, are, are you, that's just over top. You're not bullying it from the, the other no, one, right? It's just, it's just a circle on top of my cutout. Are you able to do the magic move with a, an image, like a transparent PNG? Yes, I think so. So I've could you go issues. into Photoshop and make like a transparent PNG? And yeah, that's what I was, yeah. Apply oh. that. Yeah, but that's be outside of this tool. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, it's, we were. It's PowerPoint Saturday, not <laughs> Photoshop Saturday. <laughs> no, uh, I, th I think there's got to be some way. I'm going to play with this um, next time I have some free time. Couldn't you just create the um, a smaller circle instead of your whole uh, instead of your whole frame black? Create the smaller circle in a separate file, and then just invert it. Uh, you know, do your gradient, and then just invert it, and then use that as your overlay. I don't know. That way, the white areas would turn black, and the black areas would turn white, and you do the opposite. But yeah, the circle there will be just—you can't. Can you cut that circle out of the? Like, I don't. I think because you're booling that uh, circle. That that circle there, or is that circle there booleaned, or is it? So this one's boolean. I'm wondering um, if you're booling the one with the gradient. Yeah, I mean. Just try to do it right where it sits, just to see what happens. I just need to make sure I was selecting both. Oh, no, no, it's just the outline. Wah, wah. It's very cool, though. I, I learned. I, that's a, I, I've learned a bunch of new things <laughs> today. So, uh, and then the last thing I wanted to show is I, this is my new favorite thing to do, mm. and it, it only can be done in PowerPoint. And in PowerPoint only, you, yeah. Unless you figure out how to do it in right, uh, right. Keynote. In PowerPoint, you can actually use the morph function to change the image underneath a cropped shape. And if you remember the last couple of weeks, I've asked a lot of questions about this because I know you can do it in PowerPoint. So what I'm going to do is basically make this magnifying glass. So when I move my magnifying glass over my image, you'll see a magnified version of the image. There's quite a few steps to this, and the first step is remove the background of my magnifying glass. That's under picture format, remove background. It didn't do a great job, so I'm going to mark a couple extra areas to keep. It's good enough for today. So now I've got my magnifying glass over my image. The next thing I want to do, I need to find exactly the, uh, the, the size of this circle, the diameter of the circle. So I'm going to draw my own circle. right in the middle here. Hold down control and shift so it grows from center. And I'll just nudge it just a little bit with my arrow keys. Okay. So this circle is 1.82 inches. Next, I want to make a copy of this image that I want to magnify. So it's a, a I'm going to crop it to a 1.82 inch circle. So first I'll duplicate the picture. Then I'll go to the picture format tab, arrow next to crop. I can crop it to a shape and it'll choose an oval at first or choose a oval shape and you'll see it's an oval and I want it to be a circle. To do that, I go into the format pane, the dimension tab, and I'll say, don't lock the aspect ratio. I think I said it was 1.82 by 1.82. And now it's a perfect circle. And let me make sure I got this shape. Yeah, it's the right size. 
And I want these shapes exactly overlaid, so I'll select them both, align left, align top. So now my dinosaur circle is right above my blue circle. And open my selection pane. What I want to do next is just get rid of that blue oval. I don't need it anymore. And I'm going to name these so I can keep them straight. Okay, so I've got what I need so far. I'll duplicate my slide and insert that morph transition. Now I'm going to change on my second, or, oh, I shouldn't have done that yet. Let me delete that slide. I've actually found it works better if you make this the size you want first. So I'm going to change the size of my magnification by again going into selecting the circle and then going into crop. And I can change the size of the item under. It's a good size. Roughly line these up. So this is a circle and it's cropped to this image. And I just move the image outside of the actual crop mask. So it looks blank. Now when I duplicate this slide, I can select my circle and change the crop, or select both the circle and the magnifying glass. I'm going to zoom in on the stegosaurus. Then I select just the circle that has the cropped image inside of it. I'm going to format that crop. Okay. And I will just duplicate this one more time. Grab both these items and I'll go over, oh, let's go over this, whatever dinosaur this is. He's the second from the right, right above the ichthyosaur. Again, I'll change my crop mask here. And watch this, this is one of my favorite effects that I've learned this last year. If I play my slideshow, Notice as my magnifying glass moves over, oh, I forgot to turn the transition on. <laughs> Add the transition. Notice that uh, as this transitions now, it's actually going to, you're going to see the crop underneath the circle. Ooh. And so it actually looks like you're magnifying the item itself. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> now you can combine this with what I was thinking I would do at some point is, maybe have a list of all my dinosaurs on the left here and you right. click on it and it goes to the dino you want and maybe a little information panel could come out over here about that dinosaur. What do they eat? Where did they live? When were they discovered? Um, but it's a really cool effect that you can do in PowerPoint that I can't figure out how to do in Keynote. Mm. So those are three ways in PowerPoint and Keynote that you can use to take a busy slide and really draw people's attention and focus where you want them to. Yeah, and I think that's the interesting thing there is that it, it really, you can, especially when you add some interactivity, you know, some buttons, this is something that you could theoretically deliver to somebody and let them just explore, you know, and have things like I could imagine eventually when we have USDZ available, on the other side, you have like a rotating 3D, you know, version of it. Um, and, you know, then extra data about it so that you could just kind of explore the idea. Did you ever see um, Elements? Have you ever heard of, El there was an iPad app long ago. Um, nope. it, it, it was very much like that where you could go into any element on, on the periodic table and it, would, it gave you kind of an interactive experience of, of looking at it. It's really cool. This is great. Uh, now I'm going to have to figure out how to do that magnify and keynote. <laughs> I don't know how to do it either. <laughs> so, so that would be something to think about. Uh, we've only got a handful of questions. So if you've got questions, um, go ahead and throw them in. But we've got just a handful of questions for this. Let's go. Let's jump to the first one. Douglas Carmichael is asking, does Keynote have better tools for building visually pleasing slides than PowerPoint? So I would say different, as we saw today, right, John? It's that they're different. They're very tools. different. And, and what I think is fair to say, Keynote is easier using fewer clicks to get something that feels more natural to your audience and where you really see the differences in, in the animations. They, they just by default have a really nice, I don't know other words to it than weight to them. They, they yeah. accelerate into the animation and decelerate out of it much more pleasantly. PowerPoint's just like, eh, 
and you can right. adjust those those animations. It just takes a ton of time to do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, next question. Chris Clark from Tempe, Arizona. Many education audiences have a visceral reaction against another slideshow. Any thoughts about how to compose presentations that are pleasant surprises? My favorite is the five slide limit. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, the main thing is to build um, slides that actually are interesting. You know, they, I guess I, I stay away from certain things that I feel like are very obvious slide issues. Um, I don't do picture in picture very much. I also, um, I don't do uh, bullet points almost ever. Like I'm not a bullet point person. I find other ways to format it. And I really look at broadcast. I try to think about how would broadcast show this, not how would I put it in a PowerPoint slide. And I think that that makes a big difference. Go ahead, John. I absolutely agree. I actually go the opposite end. And a lot of my slide decks will have 30 or 40 slides. The difference is they each only have one or two items on them. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's really a function of how much information per visual aspect of your slide deck. Yeah, I've worked with, I worked with one CEO and they're showing you a new slide almost every two or three seconds. And they have things that they want to say and they, they rehearse it a lot and it's just like boom, boom, boom. And it just doesn't, doesn't feel like a slide deck anymore. It's just, it's a, you know, it feels like you're kind of, I don't know, direct lining <laughs> the information from them as they, as they show it to you. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. You've stolen the words right out of my mouth, but I was going to add, there should be a word limit five words. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I really stick to just a handful of words in most slides. Uh, next question. John Preto from Las Vegas. What are the differences between, excuse oh, me, no, I think you're one. You ahead. skipped one there. Josh Kaufman. Uh, what are the differences between PowerPoint and keynote around how they manage alpha channels? I don't know. Somehow we got this jacked up here. Hold on. Yeah. We just um, skipped one. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Um, the, and I got to get my head around which question I'm answering here. Okay. Got it. Um, the main difference, and it's the selling point, I think for keynote is that, uh, hitting that alpha channel, because most of the, the work that I do, um, for client, when they say, Hey, do this PowerPoint for me or do this slideshow, um, is separating out, separating out layers, just like, uh, uh, John was doing for us there. So. Um, I'm going to have to vote on Keynote because it's simpler. I don't know Keynote. I'm a PowerPoint guy. Um, I just don't uh, I don't like to deal with Bezier curves uh, until that uh, cows come home. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that the, uh, and I have to admit that I haven't used PowerPoint for so long that I have a hard time knowing. John might know better than I do about what the differences are, are for alpha channels. Um, yeah, but uh, I just don't, I don't have an experience anymore. Go ahead, Courtney. And I'm not sure they, I think they handle embedded video differently. If you're going to be playing something like a video in a box or a transition up to a playing video, they do handle that differently. And I don't think Keynote is very good at it. And I don't think PowerPoint's very good at it. A lot of times people use a separate video and cut to it because playing back video is not their strong points. Yeah, I almost always avoid playing out video from, from the decks. Um, next question. And this one's from John Preto from Las Vegas. Why do children like dinosaurs? Go ahead, John. I read this in a book once. I don't know if it's true or not, but they like dinosaurs because they're larger and more powerful than their parents. <laughs> they're good, Mitchell. Well, they're mythical creatures that uh, yeah. we can see actual pictures. So they might actually have been here. Well, they have been, been here. Um, and they're monsters. Kids love monsters. I mean, they are the dragons, right? The, you can imagine, you can imagine like when someone didn't know and they just, they just pulled up a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton, how they would think that that was a dragon. Like this must be the bones of a dragon and it would create a whole bunch of stories about dragons and they would talk about them because they these huge beasts, uh, that, that they, that they were digging up and had no idea what age they were, you know, when they, when they pulled them up, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, so my son is seven, and he absolutely loves. There's a, a cartoon on Netflix. Uh, it's a spinoff from Fallen World, and so he has one of those dinosaurs, and he runs around with a character in its mouth, and he's like, "Ah, the dinosaur wins every time." <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> and then he wants more dinosaurs that they can fight each other. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. I don't know. They, he's absolutely just stoked for the new movie coming out. That's great. Um... Uh, sorry, we were, I, there's so many things that can be fun with education. You know, like we we were watching. I was watching Tiny World last night um, with you know the Apple thing, and I 
I felt like there, there needs to be kind of a dark, tiny world, which is, like, you know, look at this cute little thing. And now it's eaten. <laughs> and now it's like, like kids would watch a lot of that. I know as a kid, I would have watched a lot of like this. is the, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous new world for this little this little chipmunk. And unfortunately, he's not going to make it through the day. Uh, anyway. On those praying mantises either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Next question. And I believe we have already uh, answered that. Yeah, question. yeah, that one, that one already went through. I tried to skip it, but it couldn't. There, there we go. go. Josh Kaufman, can you comment on PowerPoint workflows to add lower thirds or overlays over video? Um, it so the, the easiest way to do the, those type of things is just do it over black. So um, you know the the main thing is is that. You're going to use a luma key typically um a lot of people use green uh, they'll use green and then they'll key it the problem with that is that your color processing through your switcher is 422 which means you have half the resolution in your color so any kind of curved edges or slanted edges are going to have a stair stepping um, because they're they're actually half resolution along those alpha channels and the only thing else you have to do when, when you start doing those overlays is making sure that you don't have anything that has pure blacks now in uh, you can lower the contrast a little bit in um, Keynote uh, that was out that was pointed out last week. But John, is is that possible? Would you do the same thing in in PowerPoint as far as like lowering the contrast or raising the blacks a little bit so they don't get caught up in the Luma key? I don't know. I don't know how to do a Luma key. That's why I come to office hours. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So we we uh, we talked about that last week. So you might want to check that out. Uh, next question. Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh. Slideshow playback can be challenging in software-based switchers like vMix because presenter modes take up more than one screen. Any tips for overcoming these issues? For example, converting to video. Uh, typically, we bring them in from a we pipe them in from a presentation machine. I mean, to take full advantage of a, of a slide deck, I, I highly recommend having a presentation machine. That's that, that's all it does. Uh, in that process. And it's just, it's a, it's an HDMI input. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, this is a very good use for an iPad. So yeah. iPad keynote actually has a 16 by nine out and that's what I use. So it's, you can overlay it right over top. You can use uh, telestrator mode. If you will have a pencil, an Apple pencil, there's a number of things you can use keynote for and a presentation over top is one of them. And one of the things that I do a lot is, um, the iPad, if, if you're saving your keynote file to your iCloud, and then you have your iPad, you can be still working on it on the P on the, on the, on your Mac and then just saving, 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 saving. And within a couple of seconds, it's updated on the iPad. Uh, John. One thing you might want to look into is maybe using the web version of PowerPoint specifically. Uh, most things will cross over and you can play them from there and then it will be isolated to a single uh, window in your browser. Good. Courtney. Yeah, Alex mentioned it. Just have a separate uh, separate device that's running your PowerPoint in single screen mode. That's why I use these little stick PCs because they'll run full version of Windows. They'll run PowerPoint and you can wirelessly connect to them over uh, uh, Wi-Fi and control it. And that way you don't run into problems with focus where, you know, your, your remote controller is only tied to one computer and one one uh, program running on it at a time. And that's your PowerPoint presentation. So you don't run into problems with, you know, well, I clicked on my notes over here to, to scroll down and now I'm not selecting the PowerPoint, com you know, so you, your clicker then doesn't work. So it's much better to have it always on a separate machine that is only dedicated to that PowerPoint and turn yeah. off uh, any kind of notifications on it. Make sure you do that. Though. Next question. Chris Clark from Tempe, Arizona has a question. My son Daniel has become a self-taught professional doing visual representation of quantitative data. Anyone else know of experts in this niche? He is a PowerPoint guru. Go ahead, John. Yeah, in the medical field, that is a huge and growing aspect of basically every hospital right now is being able to take large data sets and create visualizations based off of them. I know in our hospital, we have a whole department of I don't know, four or five people who just do that. That's great. Uh, next question. Jason Panks from Nashville, Tennessee. Have you used mouse passe from Bonix software to highlight areas on a presentation? And I think it's mouse pose by, uh, by Boinks um, uh, software. And we have used it. Um, and so when we're, I haven't used it with presentations, but we've definitely used it. What it does is it basically makes everything dull darker and your and your cursor brighter. And I've used it over top of present over top of showing apps and talking about things, but not used it over presentations actually. Um, next question. 
Craig McFarlane from Boston. Building a deck to explain very technical topics. What techniques do you use to include needed details? I look at build up from a simple view, add secondary slides, or click regions to unhide details. Go ahead, John. Generally speaking, your deck should not explain complicated topics. You should. And then use your deck to as like an outline view of what you're talking about. Now, sometimes you're handing out a deck to somebody without you speaking over it, in which case you can do that. Um, but but like we said before, it's it's really eliminate bullet points. There's different ways to make small bits of information interesting that don't require a bullet point. One thing I like to do is create a shape with an icon, icon over it and then just have lines of information, two or three words at a time. It serves the same function of bullet points, but people feel like you spent more time on the slide deck because you did. Um, most people just add and add and add and add until everything's there. And really you should take away, take away, take away until just what you need is there. Absolutely. Uh, Courtney. I always enjoyed presentations that start with a complete overview, like a diagram of all the parts that you're going to be talking about. And then as you cover each part, that particular part starts in the wide shot of the diagram, then zooms up to fill the screen and then adds information over the top of that. So it, it kind of takes you into where you are in the flow of whatever, you know, detail of the process that you're illustrating and it shows you where that particular item is in relationship to the other items so it, it takes you back out to see a full world view to know where that piece fits into the overall place and then zooms up on it to go into the detail and uh, next question douglas carmichael what would be the most effective solution for bringing dynamically changing data into a slide go ahead, john most people, most of the time, they will embed a chart that's linked to an Excel spreadsheet in PowerPoint. I was trying to do the same thing with numbers this week. And once I moved the table into numbers or in, into Keynote, it lost its synchronization with the original spreadsheet. So at least in PowerPoint, if you have either a chart or a, a number table that's linked to an Excel spreadsheet, they should update automatically as you update the data. Yeah, the, the PowerPoint and numbers def, definitely ceases to be connected once you cut and paste it into into Keynote. Um, the cool thing is, is that all the I don't know how it works in PowerPoint, but in when you take a numbers uh, spreadsheet and put put it into into Keynote, all the calculations and it still operates like a, a spreadsheet inside. So you can keep on updating it and changing it as needed. So it's that's I, does that work the same way in, in PowerPoint? I believe so. Or do you need to keep it connected to that Excel file? I guess is the I question. It's called dynamic linking. I think it can be either. Okay, not very good. Um, next question. Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh, PA. What are some good examples of importing outside documents into PowerPoint and Keynote? For example, tables from Word, Excel, numbers, pages, et cetera. Go ahead, John. Again, I generally try to stay away from this. I know at last answer, I was like, this is how you do it. The reason is slide decks are really best as a visualization tool and numbers or spreadsheets are best as spreadsheets. So the one thing I do sometimes use is um, sometimes I'll have a spreadsheet with um, a fancy graph or something on it with some slicers and dicers that you can interact with on a slide deck. One of the things that um, the, probably the, the biggest thing I do is bring numbers calculations, you know, so the budget into a pitch deck. <laughs> so it's usually the last slide is, is that, you know, that I, that I have there is on, and sometimes I've actually put pitch decks from numbers. That's a lot harder. The biggest problem with numbers, as far as exporting things out is it doesn't give you a sense of, uh, pages, like where does the page end and, and start and so on and so forth. That's the hardest part of, of working with it. Uh, next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh PA asks, what are some go-to templates you often reuse again and again in PowerPoint or keynote? What is the preferred state to start with templates? I mostly, um, I have to admit, I used to use black almost all the time or white all the time. I now have one that I do some of my presentations with. It has like a gradient in the center that uh, kind of blends out to black that I feel is a little, little nicer. Now go ahead, John. Most many organizations at least will have their own defined templates you have to use as part of that organization. So that's what I use at work. Um, when I'm building and creating, I'll usually just stick with either a pure white or a pla pure black uh, deck and then make customizations from there. I try not to use the built-in templates in either 
uh, PowerPoint or Keynote because they're so overused. I use slidemodel.com I have a subscription for, which does a little bit of variety on some basic templates to get some nice results. And, and the, the corporate ones can either take very little time and then inflict them on everyone, or they take, I mean, we've had ones where the design team spend uh, months, you know, designing every deck and everything. And then it's, then you just want to use that because it really feels like the whole company and it, it's worth it. If you're a company looking at those things, it's definitely worth doing. All right. Great job, John. Amazing. Like I learned a ton of new things <laughs> just just watching you do it. I don't I don't learn a lot in Keynote very often, and uh, I learned I don't, I'm a whole a whole bunch of things that I hadn't thought of before. So I really appreciate your contribution there. Thank you much. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll we'll have to think about what we're going to do next week. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a break now uh, and uh, get ready for our education. Uh, we'll come back. We're going to give the educators what happens when we we're supposed to stop at. 10 of so that the educators can get in here and get tested, but then we're always late. So then they're late. So we will take 15 minutes right now. Um, we're going to go ahead and turn off the YouTube. So goodbye, YouTube. It's great to see you. Bye. I don't know if it's off. Oh, there it is. Now we whisper to Mitchell. Mitchell. Yes. He doesn't like that. He hates it, but we love doing it because he hates it. Off to Society Look how red my face gets when you do that. that. <laughs> it matches your sign. Yeah. <laughs> it's like old school. It reminds me of being like a third grader. Someone says they didn't like something, so then we just kept on doing it. Mr. Lindsay, would you like to share that with the rest of the class? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Are we done? Are we are we off? No, yeah, yeah, no, well, no. Is the, is the, yeah, is, thanks are, for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Once again. You're good. That, that is going to be.